So I got to know, why did you decide to pick up everything, risk your entire life, savings, relationships to move to Cerro Gordo, this ghost town? Yeah. Uh, it's a question I ask myself a lot, but <laughs> the I would say it's that kind of searching for an adventure for purpose, you know, for something a little bit more than I currently had. I think I moved out here from Austin, Texas, where I had a pretty comfortable apartment. I had a lot of friends, you know, a good job. But it's still kind of like there was that desire for something more, that like feeling that there must be something more out there that maybe I was capable of more. And uh, I came out here looking for the adventure. I thought maybe I came in March of 2020, right at the beginning of the pandemic, thinking, hey, I'll come out for a couple of weeks, hang out, go back to my normal life. And it's uh, four years later, almost to the date, four years later now, and I'm still here. But talk about like why there and not just like, because I mean, a lot of people that when they go, in, they want to quote unquote, like find themselves or find purpose, maybe they end up like going back to school for a different degree. Maybe they end up moving to a different city. Maybe they end up going on like a backpacking trip in Europe or something like that. Like, why did you pick the most extreme scenario? This place is a combination of things that I've been interested in, in my whole life. You know, we were talking before about Robert Greene and Robert always talks about how you can combine your unique interests and skills in a way that nobody else can. And that's how you kind of get to mastery. I remember growing up, my grandfather lived with us and my grandfather just used to love the show Gunsmoke, you know, that like old Western show where there's always a problem to solve, these types of things. Um, I graduated a little bit. I went to school for real estate and finance. So I always had this desire to, you know, I always loved buildings, the architecture of them. I always saw myself like tilting my head up in the sky when I was somewhere. And then both my parents were teachers. So education was very important. So they were like, hey, you know, you need to get a degree, got the degree in finance, realized I really didn't want to do that. Kind of like left that, did a bunch of different things. And eventually I found myself in Austin, Texas, and I was working in digital marketing mainly with a lot of authors, you know, that I know you know as well. And then also I had a, a side project of a, like a backpacker hostel, essentially like a bed and breakfast. And so I kind of loved this idea of history and hospitality. My bed and breakfast in Austin was in an old Victorian mansion from the 1800s. And so like, it was really cool to think about these people could come, you know, like experience time in the, something that's like unique to that city. And so I guess all that to say, pandemic hit, I think we were all questioning where we were, where we were going to go. I knew it was going to be an important time. And uh, I had bought Cerro Gordo in 2018, so two years prior to that, and tried to do it as kind of like a long distance hospitality play. And it just wasn't getting anywhere. And so I moved out here understanding that it might be a little bit different. It would be interesting, but it was more just like maybe an opportunity to test myself, you know, to see what I was kind of made with. Yeah, and you put like what close to a million dollars into it up front, right? Yeah, it was it was one point four million in twenty eighteen. Uh, I didn't have nearly that much money. I was a lot of that was like a hard money loan, which you know is basically like a loan shark. And then um, a couple friends kicked in some money, uh, some of who you know as well. Paint a picture for the audience for what this place kind of looks like, because as I'm reading your book and as I'm reading about Cerro Gordo, I'm like mortified to even want to spend like two hours there based on the living situation. And you're talking about building it into this hospitality place. So talk a bit about like what it was when you first got it, when you first experienced it. Yeah, it's it's rough. I mean, so it's a former mining town. The main mining activity was back in the 1860s. So in the 1860s, they were mining silver and lead mainly. And so it grew to be about 4,000 people by the late 1870s. Um, by the late 1880s, they had lost the vein. Everybody pretty much packed it up and left. 1910, a guy named L.D. Gordon, the guy whose house I'm sitting in right now, came along. He discovered zinc and he kind of built it into a boom town once again. As for a mine, it had an active life from about 1860 to about 1940, which is a really long active life for a mining camp. Usually they thought these things would last five or six years. Um, but to paint the picture a little more, it's up in the mountains. So when people think mining town, ghost town, they think like in the desert a lot. And we are in the desert, but I'm also at 8,500 feet in elevation right now. I'm about three and a half hours from Los Angeles and three and a half hours from Las Vegas in what's called the Inyo Mountains. And so out my front windows, I see Sequoia National Park or, um, and Sierra Nevada and Mount Whitney. Out the back, I see Death Valley. But because it's so remote, you know, there's no running water. Um, when I got here for the first time, there's no running water. There is no cell service, really. There's definitely no Wi-Fi. And it was just a collection of, let's say, 20 ish buildings spread across about 400 acres. Again, just at the end of an eight mile dirt road in the middle of nowhere. And I think that, I mean, initially that's enchanting in a way. It's there's something very romantic about the American West and this idea of like an abandoned town. Um, but logistically, even just getting here the first time, I realized that this is going to be a project, you know, a serious, serious project. But I think it was 
the right project at the right time for me. Like going back to it, I had just turned 30 and I was kind of wondering what, what am I doing? You know, I had this comfortable life, but I felt like I wasn't really tapping into everything. And this seemed to like excite me in a way that other projects weren't holding my excitement. And so I think to your point, like some people are completely repelled being here. Don't get me wrong. Like living with no running water, especially after being here for four years now is like not for the faint of heart, but for me, at least the trade-off is worth it. If I wasn't enjoying being up here, like the challenges, the skills I've had to learn and all that, I wouldn't still be here, but it's definitely not an easy place to live by any means. So how have you survived? Like, how do you take a shower? How do you get food? How do you get water? Like talk a bit about your experience with all that. It's kind of been a progression. You know, the first, the first step with shower, I start off with, you know, those like camping bags, it's essentially like a, a garbage bag with a thermometer on them that you leave in the sun and it hopefully it gets hot enough. And then you kind of put it over your head and it pours out. Um, then I started trucking up water at like five gallon buckets at a time in the back of a truck. And then eventually we put in some storage tanks. So now we have two storage tanks up here and each one of them can hold about 2,500 gallons. And so I have like an old military truck that goes to the bottom of the hill, eight miles away, fills up the water there, trucks it back up here. And I can usually bring up about a thousand gallons at a time. And so these days, um, there's a running shower, there's a working bathroom, there's a sink, which uh, may seem very basic to everybody listening. But for me, it was, I mean, to go from no shower to shower is just, I mean, it changes your life basically. And so that was a big thing um, for, for like, the cell service and internet type stuff, we originally used like at and hotspots. I would bring one of those up here and that would give me enough service to send emails and things, not enough to stream anything. Um, but these days with things like Starlink and different things, like it's a lot easier to get internet up here. And so I think that like over the past four years, it's gone from when I first moved up, it was basically like camping indoors is how I would describe it. There isn't any amenities, but you do have a roof over your head. These days, the house I'm in, it still doesn't have central heat. I'm still burning wood, but I have a shower, a bathroom, you know, kind of somewhat of the normal amenities. So did you have any kind of survival skills like before doing this? Like did you ever, were you in like the Boy Scouts or anything like that? A, a little bit. I mean, I was in the Boy Scouts growing up. I grew up in Florida though, a very flat state, you know, no mountains. And to think that I'm now living at like 8,500 feet is crazy. And so there wasn't a lot of those skills. And I think that part of the desire to come out here was a desire to learn more of those things. You know, I think that there was some draw of me that wanted to, test the physical and mental limits of maybe what I could do. And I knew that being out here would be a challenge in both of those things. And it's pretty much, I like to say, there's not a lot of people coming to save you in the desert. You have to be pretty self-reliant pretty quickly. And so I kind of, the accelerated timeline of that was something I really enjoyed over the past couple of years. What did, what did your diet look like early on? Not good. <laughs> really, really, it's still really, really bad. I mean, when I first came up here, just to paint a picture of how unprepared I was when I first arrived, uh, I was in essentially slippers, you know, those like all bird shoes that they make. They're like cloth. They're basically like slippers. I was in, I was going from Austin, Texas, where I was living in a nice apartment. I had a little two wheel drive based Tacoma truck. And so the first day I got here, I drove pretty much straight out here 24 hours and I didn't even make it all the way to town because like snow started happening and I couldn't get all the way into town. So I walked in my moccasins basically to the ca cabin and kind of crashed. And so the next morning I woke up, there's three or four feet in this of snow in the road. So I couldn't bring my car into town and ended up just living off of like canned goods, you know, sometimes expired canned goods that were left up here from who knows when, because like the closest grocery store, closest market, we'll call it that is about an hour. The closest real grocery store is probably about two. And so it was kind of a thrown into the deep end pretty quick. And it's still like, it's still not great to be fully honest. Like in Austin, I was going to the grocery store once or twice a day and I would go get fruit, vegetables, whatever I needed. Now, uh, fruit is few and far between. Unfortunately, vegetables are too, but uh, it's not canned goods anymore either. So you've been there about four years. People struggle with loneliness. They struggle with not being connected to people. They struggle with you know not being in a relationship. You've taken loneliness, I think, to the extreme. I mean, because you you kind of like you know you left everything behind and just moved out to uh, Cerro Gordo. Talk a bit about like what loneliness and spending time by yourself has taught you and how it's really shaped you into the person you are now. When I first moved here, it was a good time to move here because it was, again, during the pandemic and I felt like everybody was a little bit lonely in some way. You know, we were all kind of having to do some type of distancing or some type of isolation in different manners. And so that part of my brain that was like, oh, well, all of your friends are hanging out without you was eased by the idea that, well, no, they're actually not hanging out without you. You know, nobody's hanging out. And so I think for the first year, 
I almost thought I had a a better part of the situation because I at least had all of this space to roam around, you know, do these hikes and different things. And so that was really enjoyable. Um, I think as the world opened up a little bit and I started, you know, hearing of my friends hanging out more and all these different things, the loneliness definitely struck me a lot more. But by then I had been documenting a lot of my time up here and making videos for YouTube and different places like that. And those videos had gotten quite popular. And so I felt like for a period of time, it was very isolated, like kind of like a solo journey. Then it was kind of like a shared journey, but primarily online. But then eventually a lot of those people that were following online made their way up here, you know, and kind of like became the community of the town, whether that was like a volunteer or some of the local people that were in the town around us that wanted to come and check it out or help out in different ways. And so I think that it's interesting being out here. I am very isolated, but I almost feel more connected to the people that I am connected to than I was in Austin. Meaning, because like the people that come up here are coming up here for a fairly specific purpose. You know, they probably love history. They probably love the American West mining. And so I feel like it like curates who's coming up here and hanging out here. And so I'm much more likely to kind of have a similar personality than, you know, let's say somebody randomly off the street down there in Austin or another big city. But it's still something I struggle with. It's still, there's times where, yeah, of course, I'd rather be watching a football game with my friends in Austin than, you know, hammering nails into a cabin with nobody for a couple miles in any direction. Um, and so it's just been, it comes in waves. But I think that at this point, the peace and kind of the quietness of the like distraction that was in Austin is is overweighs, you know, not being here. It's easy to stay distracted in big cities. Like for instance, when I said I had to go to the grocery store all the time, I would make up excuses where I had to go to the different stores multiple times a day, you know, just to keep myself busy. But up here, all that kind of falls away and you kind of think about what you'd rather be doing. And for me, the purpose of this place came in the context and understanding the history here. Because I think that you know, if you can place yourself as part of something larger than yourself, whether that's, you know, a religion, a job, a, a organization, whatever it may be, you kind of get more enjoyment out of it every day. I mean, even on a smaller example, if if you were walking, if you live in a city and you walk by a park every single day for 10 years, but one day you decide to stop and look up the history of that park, that park is going to mean a lot more to you, you know, the next time you walk by that park. And it kind of is like, brings it to life. And I think over my first year being here, I researched every single building, every single person that was here, every single previous owner. And it has kind of brought the history of the place to life. And it brought like my part of that history as well to life. And it made me feel again, that, that connection to something larger. And I think within that, it made everything more purposeful, more like feeling long-term, I think, than anything that I worked on before. And that just brought a lot of the you know, satisfaction in my life. People struggle with uncertainty. And you have experienced uncertainty to a totally, a totally different level. How have you learned to, to manage that? Given that there's times where you know you don't, given that there is like no running water, you've had to deal with snow, you've had to deal with a pandemic, you've had to deal with all kinds of natural disasters, if you will, that have come your way with with everything. How have you learned to like you know harness the emotions that come along with that? When I first came up, everything almost felt like a crisis. You know, like when there was a flood, when there was an earthquake, we've had a flood, an earthquake, a fire, you know, hail storms, everything in between. But I think it's almost that muscle of like, everything is figured outable. And I think that the more things you figure out, even on a small scale, you kind of grow that muscle a little bit each time. And so each time something phases you a little bit less as you go through it. And so for, at first, let's say, you know, the road got washed out in a flood. That was like a crisis for me. That was, oh my God, like we're going to have a disaster on our hands. But the road is washed out four times now, and I've rebuilt it each time with a backhoe. And so now when it happens, you know, our friend Ryan Holiday likes to say that, you know, I have evidence now. I'm not just like banking on like hope. I have evidence. I can like pull up that file in my brain, like we fixed this road before, you know, we're going to figure it out. If we can figure out rebuilding an eight mile road, what else can we figure out? You know, we're rebuilding an entire hotel here in the middle of nowhere. And so I think for me, it's kind of that, that belief and confidence in yourself that that sense of agency i guess is another way to put it that no matter what's thrown at me like i have the ability to respond to it and make it a little bit better and i think that's something that like i didn't necessarily have when i first came and i think it came in small steps you know i when i first came i wasn't doing big projects i think the first thing i did was rebuild a porch on maybe you know a 10 by 20 cabin just the front porch but then i was like oh i can do that oh i can do that and then kind of like over time that you know, figure outable muscle kind of develop stronger and stronger. And these days, I mean, after four years of fires and floods and earthquakes and blizzards, I feel like 
you know, anything doesn't phase me maybe in the way that it did four years ago. And what's been the, the scariest thing to deal with since you've been there? In 2020, we had a fire that uh, burned down one of the buildings. And that was by far the scariest because it was kind of the centerpiece of the town. And it was the the central point of all the plants. It was the most it was the most beautiful building in town. It was where we all hung out. It was going to be the main area for everybody to hang out, to like congregate in this hospitality play that we were doing. And I remember that, you know, the night it happened, it was an electrical fire and there was four other people up here that night. And the next day I was kind of just distraught. It was like, again, this is a place that I pushed all my life savings into, that I pushed all of my kind of like social capital into with people and friends that are kind of in part of it. And I just kind of pushed everything in. I, was, I kind of felt very lost in that moment of what's going to happen next. You know, do I go back to Austin with my tail between my legs? How can we ever kind of recover from this? Um, I remember the old owner of the of the property came up and he saw me looking at the hotel and I, I immediately thought he was going to just be like infuriated, you know, that this place is like destroying all these things. I remember he kind of put his arm, his hand on my shoulder and he said, you know, this is part of history now. It was bound to happen eventually. You know, you can't change what happens, but what happens from here is up to you. And I think sometimes in those moments, you need something to cling on to. And the idea that what happens from here is up to you is something that like I clung on to pretty tightly over the next few months. It was kind of my marching orders, if you will, where, you know, he's right. I can't change it. It is part of the history. There's been fires here since it was a town. There's been four or five big fires. And so, but what happens next is up to me. And that kind of became the rallying cry, both for myself, but also the community of people that developed around the town. And now it's blossomed to, you know, like a community of 5 million people between the different social medias that, that kind of follow along with the progress here. And this, at this point, I'm looking out the window. I keep looking out the window because I'm looking at the hotel that's rebuilt now. And I think that of the hundreds of people that have come up and helped pitch in in some way. And now they all have their own story and their own connection to this place. And I feel like that's just going to allow the history of the town to live on for a lot longer. And from day one, you know, my goal is to preserve the history here and allow future generations to enjoy the natural beauty and the inspiration that I kind of draw from it. And I feel like in that moment, the, the best decision probably financially, mentally, emotionally, every spiritually would have been to, maybe not spiritually, it would have been to kind of like figure out the next project. But I think by doubling down rebuilding and kind of going all in on this, I found a part of me that I didn't know was there before. And it's kind of made me wonder what else have I not fully saw through in the past, I guess is kind of what it left me thinking. And I think um, that's been definitely the hardest part so far. Talk about like walking around the town and what you've had to like endure. I mean, I know you've had to like walk through tunnels and it's been like pretty tight. Like I think the audience would appreciate like hearing some stories around that. Yeah, it's it's so it's a barren place. We're in the high desert. So basically imagine the desert, but in the mountains, there's no trees. I'm looking out the window right now. I see one tree across maybe 80 acres of property right now. And so around the building, you have a lot of old buildings, um, but you also have a lot of mines. Again, this is a mining town. And so there's 30 miles of mines underneath the property. Um, back in the day, they pulled about $500 million worth of minerals out of the hill if you adjust it for inflation. And there's just so much to see and do. And you know, my first time here, I would I would go on these beautiful hikes, see all the different things, but I would kind of stay out of the mines because, again, these are mines built 150 years ago out of dynamite. They're not exactly structurally sound, and I mean, there's a, there's signs that are all over the West that say "stay out and stay alive" on abandoned mines just because they're very dangerous. But I think eventually that curiosity, that desire to understand the context of the mines, overwhelmed me, and so I would, you know, I'd go 20 feet into the mine and then run back out, and then 50 feet into the mine, run back out, and kind of this this game. And at this point, I've repelled 900 feet down and like roped my way back up 900 feet. And I've gone all through all the levels of the mine. And I think it just like, again, brings the town to life that much more when you understand, you know, every building on the surface is only here because of what happened underground. And I think it took me a year of being up here to fully understand that, you know, this whole town exists to service the mine that was here. And so it can be scary, it can be claustrophobic. But I think for me, when I'm in the mines, you ma- you have to imagine the darkest place that's possible to be dark. There's not any light, you know, there's no light seeping in from anywhere. Especially if you go, if you go down 900 feet and then go off to one of the side shafts, there's no light, there's no sound, there's no animals because no animals are living down there. There might be bats at higher levels, but they don't go down that far. And I think in those moments, I'm so focused on just not dying. You know, I'm so focused on getting through the collapses that the rest of the world kind of like dissolves away. So all the anxieties on the surface that I'm thinking about, you know, like whether it's like, oh, I need more water. I have this with my work. I have this with my job kind of go away. And I almost enter as close to 
flow state as I've probably experienced, you know, without doing athletics of any sort where I'm just focused on what's in front of me. Um, and so I, I love going into the mines. It's something that I know isn't for everybody. Uh, I, I, I definitely understand that, but to me, it's, it's interesting. It's like history and it's just, I don't know, it's fun. People struggle with uncertainty. They struggle with like loneliness, as I've talked about, they struggle with like adversity. Like when, it, when, when problems happen, people in many cases tend to freeze, catastrophize the situation, focus on the problem. And then do they just end up not progressing towards a solution based on what you've learned, you know, in the last few years with what you've dealt with there, like what's your message to people that are still struggling with, with stuff like this? Yeah. I think that like the biggest takeaway that I've taken over the last few years is that, that I can figure it out. You know, I, I go back to that, what I said before that, like, there are ways to solve it. You are going to figure it out. And like, by taking the first step, no matter how small it is, you're going to build up that muscle and you're going to be able to tackle bigger and bigger things. And I think that for me, it was just proving that to myself was just that boost of confidence that I wanted so much. And I think that like the alternative for me was worse. I know this is very cliched, but for me, so again, I graduated with a degree in finance and I immediately got a job at a bank. And I remember my second week, we got sent to Gurney, Illinois, which is just outside of Chicago. And we were there at some bank doing some due diligence job. I remember sitting around the, looking around the table and there was just everybody five, 10 years ahead of me. And none of them were happy. You know, none of them seemed like to be enjoying life. And none of them were like leaning into life or, and by any means. And so I think that in that moment, I thought, you know, this is kind of the path that I was going to take if I didn't take steps, no matter how small. And I don't think it starts, it doesn't start with jumping into buying a town. I don't think buying a town is the answer for anybody to do. I think that there are those small steps, that thing that, you know, that does light you up, that does excite you. And, you know, whether that's in the afternoons you go and you map a park or something like that. I think that there's smaller steps you can do to fulfill that passion and kind of like follow that rabbit hole where it takes you. Regarding the goal of Sarah Gordo and what you're doing with it, like I know you mentioned like you rebuilt the hotel. Like let's just say that tomorrow you could snap your fingers and everything's done. Like what does it look like? Yeah, it's hard. I think that the the the, the idea of done is really tough in a situation like this just because the town used to have let's say a couple hundred buildings. And so I could rebuild this town for the rest of my life, which I would love to do. I'd love, I think that this is a project I'll work on for the rest of my life. And I think there's a lot of like comfort in that commitment where I'm not having to think about what's the next project, what's the next project, what's the next project. Um, but for me to answer the question, like I would love to get it to where it's stabilized, meaning like it's paying for myself. People are coming up and visiting, people are enjoying themselves. That would be the hotel is built. Um, maybe we add 10 cabins around the town core. There's camping on the backside. So there's a lot of hospitality options. There's tours every day. Um, I would love to one day zoom out and kind of like do a brand. You know, I, I've thrown around the idea of doing a whiskey brand for a long time, just because I think the American West, you know, up in a mining town would be kind of an interesting story. Um, but I think that if I could snap my fingers and it'd be done, the hotel will be done. We have, we have a movie theater here. We have about four other buildings on site that I'd like to finish. And people were coming and visiting every day. You, you mentioned this is a project. Like, do you see yourself like bouncing back and forth between like other parts of the United States, or do you see yourself just living there full time for the rest of your life? I don't think I could do every day, all day for the rest of my life. You know, it's been four years, and it's like it's hard. I wasn't like I wasn't a guy that had a ton of weight to lose to begin with, and I've probably lost like thirty pounds living up here just because of the physical stress and the bad eating. And so, I, right now, my main goal is getting the hotel open, and that, that's my like. That's my break point at which time I think I'll probably not be here during the winters. The winters can be pretty difficult up here. There's a lot of snow. I can see myself living, you know, in a local town like Lone Pine or maybe the Las Vegas or Los Angeles, you know, if I needed to zoom out a little bit more, but I'd love to keep spending at least, let's say four months a year up here, six months a year up here for the rest of my life. I just, I mean, I truly love it. And I think that it's almost, it's a canvas. It's not a blank canvas at this point, but it's a canvas to kind of paint a picture that hopefully lasts for a very long time. And I just really love the idea. It gets me fired up to think about what else we could introduce here. Like for instance, right now we're redoing one of the old cabins into a music studio. So it'll be like a recording studio. So musicians can come up and record and hopefully, you know, like draw some inspiration from looking at the mountain range and stuff. You know, we're building, like I said, we're, we're building the, uh, the movie theater right now. We have a a foot race that's in our second year now that's that's happening in a, in a month that kind of is a race up the road. And so like, I love the idea of introducing more events and properties to it forever. But I think the day to day, you know, 24, seven, 365 days, this is not super sustainable. Um, especially if like 
I want any semblance of like a normal social life of any way. Uh, it's just not, it's just not, <laughs> it's not going to happen over here. You hear a lot of times that, that people, they can have all the money in the world. They can have all the fame in the world. They can have all of this and still be completely miserable and unhappy. You alluded to that with some of the people you worked with in the, in the finance industry. Based on like your experience over the last four years, like what is it about just completely separating yourself and removing yourself from all that that allows you to create this path to fulfillment and happiness? I think for me, it was it was latching onto that thing again that that felt like I was connected to something bigger than just my day to day job. I do feel like there's like a lineage here in the history, but then also there's a little bit less, there's a lot less comparison going on up here. You know, I don't know what people are doing day in and day out in Austin. I have no idea what my friends are doing most of the time. You know, and so I know that I want to do and like. I kind of draw the satisfaction from that. And I, again, I don't think that, again, the answer is moving to the middle of nowhere necessarily. I don't think you can do that. I think you can do that in much smaller ways. You know, you can kind of, again, take those steps to finding what brings you that sense of purpose, that thing that Robert Greene would call your, your life's task or whatever, you know, whatever you feel in your heart you're drawn to. There's a lot of ways to approach that that aren't such drastic steps. But yeah, for me, this is kind of the best place that I've been able to do that. And I do think that the a benefit of being up here has been that lack of noise and, you know, comparison with everybody in Austin. What was like the breaking point for you? Like, cause you, you, you mentioned the early times that were super rough and now you've gotten into a place where you've rebuilt this hotel. Like, it seems like you've got some survival stuff going, you got, you know, you got a bathroom, you got a place to take a shower and stuff. Do you remember like the point where you're like, man, like, I feel like I'm definitely doing the right thing. Like things are on the up and up. Was there a moment like that for you? Yeah, I think for me, it was the first time we hosted a, a group event. So we had a bunch of people come and metal detect. And I know it seemed kind of ridiculous, but like I had built this online community, but I couldn't see any of them. They weren't real to me. You know, it was just like, oh, but then that event, I invited a bunch of people. Up. I was like, hey, if you have a metal detector, come on up. We'll metal detect the property. We'll try to find some old coins. And to see like the actual people, you know what I mean? Come up and like be like resonating so deeply. They're like, oh, that's the Belshaw house. And like understand the history to the level that maybe I didn't even understand. And the that deep connection that they're having the property. That was when I was like, oh, okay, we're onto something. Like people are like enjoying this. They're they're taking it upon themselves to dive even deeper into the history here and the story here. And then I think that was like a good reminder that and to your point before, like physical community, like real world community is very important too. And so I've always loved that idea of creating spaces in the real world for people to kind of a congregate. And that's what I was doing in Austin with a hostel. It was just a place for travelers to congregate in the real world, you know, and like exchange ideas, become friends. And this is a much larger version of that. But again, it's a physical space for people to gather. They're similar minded. And I just, I don't know, I get a lot of excitement out of that. What about your story and what you've done do you think resonates the most with all these people that follow you? I think the main thing, the overarching, there's a lot of subcategories we can get into, but I think the overarching thing is just People got to see somebody almost in real time find their purpose, I think, and like find that passion and that enthusiasm towards what they're doing. Because if you watch the videos, when I come up, I'm excited, but you can tell it's still kind of like I'm tipping my toe into the like, is this the project? Is this the what I'm going to do for the rest of my life? And then you kind of see it around the time of the hotel and the rebuild of like, oh no, this is what we're doing. And just, I do like, I, I'm working 18 hours a day some days. And just like that, I think that anytime you see somebody fired up about what they're doing and just like giving it their all, you get really excited about that. I mean, I follow some guy on Instagram that carves marble and like, I don't care about marble at all, but like, he's so excited about what he's doing that I just like am drawn to that kind of person. And I think that's kind of what draws it. I think underneath that, there's a few things. There's, you know, the history lovers. I try to explore the history here quite a bit. The adventure seekers, you know, I'm, I'm going to the mines, nature lovers. I'm going on really long hikes. So there's kind of like a lot of subcategories, but I think the overarching thing is just, yeah, I just came from a pretty you know, comfortably numb existence, we'll call it in Austin to then like a very difficult, but emotionally fulfilling life. And I think that a lot of people are searching for that in different means. You know, a lot of people are searching for that with all sorts of, you know, a lot of different ways. And I just, I think I found that here and in, in this old town. And I think that resonated with a lot of people. I've touched on this a little bit, but I think a lot of people are feeling kind of lost right now and they're looking to find their purpose. They're just at a place where like, oh, like there's so much stress. There's so much going on in the world. I hate my job. I just went through a breakup. I just, you know, quit drinking or whatever the example is. And, may, and maybe they, they can't find something like Sarah Gordo to, to dive headfirst into, but they're trying to find some fulfillment, trying to trying to find their purpose as as you did. What advice would you have for them, like based on what you learned about the whole notion of, of meaning and fulfillment over the last few years? And a lot of this is going to kind of harp on what Robert Green talks about too, but it is kind of 
going back to childhood and thinking about what excited you, you know, what lit you up, where, what was kind of like your driving force. And then thinking beyond that, like, what am I good at? And is there a way that I can combine what I'm good at with kind of what excites me? And so for me, for instance, I cut my teeth in digital marketing for like 10 years in storytelling, working with authors, but then I had my finance degree in real estate. And then I had my grandfather, who was the biggest Western fan ever. So the idea that at Cerro Gordo, I can combine Western real estate and storytelling, you know, with the social media now just felt like a very fortuitous thing. And so I would say, yeah, kind of like maybe even get a piece of paper, write about like, oh yeah, when I was a kid, I did love drawing comics or whatever it may be, you know, and oh, I'm actually good at this and try to find a way to kind of almost a matchmaker within those two things. And I think that that's kind of what led me here, even if it was subconsciously. And I think that when I think back, that was probably what excites me more than anything I was doing before. Talk about stoicism. I know we talked before we recorded about it and how we how we both have implemented that in our own lives for the sake of transformation. Describe it in your own words and how, you know, people can really use it to their to their advantage. Yeah, stoicism is like an operating system for life. You know, it's a philosophy that's designed to be in practice. It's not for the people sitting around on a porch, you know, navel gazing, thinking about life. It's like I'm in a very difficult situation. How do I get through this? And, you know, it was developed by actual doers, people that were doing real things. You know, Marcus Aurelius, probably the most famous Stoic out there was like the emperor of Rome. You know, he was in a very, and and potentially the most important Stoic text was Meditations, which was his personal journal to himself, you know, that he wasn't intending on publication. These were notes to himself of how do I handle these different stresses? How do I be a better brother? How do I be a better father? How do I be a better emperor? And so I think that these are, methods that have been tested for 2000 years at least and tried and true. And so you're kind of being able to bank off of, you know, some of the most smartest people over time that have been through some of the most trying experiences of their time. And so for me, I think about it a lot, you know, I mentioned during the fire, my neighbor, the old owner came up and put his hand on my shoulder and told me that. But I also thought to the, you know, there was a story about Thomas Edison back in the day and Edison had a factory and his factory was burning down. And in that moment, He was very upset, you know, obviously. And he went outside and his son was uh, looking at the fire and he said, Hey, son, go get your mother and all of your siblings. They'll never see a fire like this again. You know, so instead of like freaking out and screaming, he was just accepting what was happening and trying to make the best of it. And so that's kind of the stoic idea of like amor fati, which is like a love of fate. And so it kind of like not just embracing what's happening around you, but like truly loving it and using it as fuel for whatever happens next. And so for me, I could have whined and moaned and whatever about the the hotel forever. But instead I used it as fuel to kind of build this big community, this resonance with the town, this like purpose of keeping going. And so I think for anybody out there, like stoicism is like, it's tried and true, you know, and again, it does like, it's designed to make your life better in certain circumstances. And I think I may like working in it for 10 years, uh, we've talked about before, but I've worked with Ryan Holiday, who's, you know, probably the person responsible for exposing the most people to stoicism these days than than anybody. And I think that by being around it for so long, I've kind of been able to draw upon it in those difficult circumstances. And I think that that is like the testament to a good philosophy is like, if it actually is helping your life in those most difficult moments, if you're able to draw upon it and actually put it in practice. And so I think for me, that's what stoicism is. You know, it's something that it's a philosophy that's useful every day that I'm able to call upon in the worst circumstances that makes my life better. It's pretty wild that in the most isolated time of your life, you've also become quote unquote kind of famous with the story and how it's you know built into this massive social media following through your ability to connect with people. Has fame like gotten in the way of meaning and purpose or fulfillment for you at all? Not directly. I think it's interesting too, because you know, fame obviously can mean tons of things, but I think in this time it's like, it's like no, internet notoriety is probably a more comfortable way to, to put it, but it didn't really hit me. Cause again, during the pandemic was when the channel really exploded. It went from like zero to a million subscribers in less than a year, but it's during the pandemic. And so I wasn't seeing anybody and the TikTok went from zero to 3 million in two months. And so I wasn't like seeing any people. And so it didn't resonate. I was just numbers on a screen, but as people started coming up, as people started emailing me more, it was good. And I think that it's overwhelmingly positive for the town. I think it can be difficult personally when there then feels like a sense of obligation to all these people that are supporting you in different ways. And so for instance, maybe a year and a half in, I was very, very exhausted about the rebuilding and the videos and everything that I was doing. And I got very 
like in a dark place mentally, I would say, just like very depressed. And like, yeah, I felt like I was letting people down every week, no matter what I was doing. I think that eventually, if an if an audience of any size gets to a certain extent, um, nobody's going to be happy with everything that you're doing, right? No matter what you no matter what you're trying. And I felt like I was giving it my all to the to the place, and then also trying to document it. And still, I was just letting people down. And if I would miss a week in video, I would get a thousand emails. They're like, what are you doing? You know, like, where are you? Like I, this, my, I would play my week around this. And I just felt this, I felt like I had signed up for this contract that I didn't want to be part of anymore. And that was all fully myself interpreting it as my own. This wasn't an actual contract. This was just me fully in my head. And so I think that like, it took me time to kind of release that anxiety and getting back. The original reason I started making videos is because I was bored during the pandemic. You know, some people started baking bread, they made sourdough, everybody got into their like, they really got into their pandemic hobby. And I started making videos because I brought up a camera. I actually borrowed one of the cameras that we use for Daily Stoic. And I brought it up here to take astrophotography. I wanted to learn how to take photos of the stars. And the videos did really well. And so then it became, oh, wow, this is like something that is helping the town a lot. You know, I'm enjoying it. It's a creative outlet that I never had before. And the, within that, I just got a little bit too in my own head about fulfilling the what I saw as the obligation to everybody that was supporting the town because I was getting so much benefit of the town. I felt like, oh, I have to be providing an hour long video every single week. And I just got a little lost in myself, but even to the point where I think on social media, I try to portray as close to what's happening up here as we can. But anytime a camera's on, it changes a little bit, right? It changes person's personality. It changes everything. And so I think for me, at times I got lost of like, what percentage is character and what percentage is me and what, how you kind of get lost of like, what is what after a little bit of time, if you sp spend the majority of your day documenting what you're doing, it almost felt a little bit Truman show-esque, I guess, if in a little bit of time, but I think I'm in a lot like healthier place with it now. I think people are captivated by stuff on social media at times because of drama, because of like the cliffhanging story, because of sensationalism and stuff. Did you ever find yourself like when you were filming, like making your situation like out to be worse than it actually is for the sake of keeping people like drawn into what you were doing? Not necessarily. I didn't want to. No, not really. The, the, the thing that would happen though, I remember early on, I made, let's say five videos and I had a really famous YouTuber come up, this guy, this person that had, uh, let's say 10 or 15 million subscribers. Right. And they, they sat me down and they're like, you don't watch a lot of YouTube, do you? And I was like, no, why? You know, I was like, I was like kind of oblivious. They're like, I can tell because you don't make your videos how you would make popular YouTube videos. I was like, what do you mean? You know, and he goes, oh, well, like you need to kind of keep people engaged. That's what YouTube looks for. So you need to put in like hooks throughout it to keep people watching as you keep going. And I was like, oh, okay, well, you're more successful than I am in this. Then like, maybe I should try to do that stuff, you know? And then it was like a bit, another YouTuber code would come up and I started watching more of their stuff. And it went from, I would create videos that I got really excited about that I would want to watch that I thought were cool to trying to like be more like these YouTubers that, I'm not, not, I'm not going to be able to do what they're doing. And so I think it was a, it was just like a good example of losing my original, like kind of marching orders in it. And I just didn't like when I would do this types of, if I would do a video that like, I, have to, I like to let shots linger for a long time, like a shot of the bushes to linger for like three seconds. And that's crazy. Like in the regular YouTube, you're cutting way quicker than that. And so if I make these quicker, quicker cut videos, I just don't enjoy them more. And so again, kind of going back to the getting lost in the social media world, I've had to get to the place where I just, again, try to make what I enjoy kind of early on. And I think that's what brought the original audience and they resonate with it more as well. It just goes to show that people really, people love authenticity, right? And the more you stick to that, I think the more, not only you're going to be happier, but your audience will be happier too, because people can sense when you're trying to be somebody you're not, right? And the moment that they realize that they're quickly, I think, just kind of turned off I and mean, they're just not going to either want, they're not going to want to engage with you. They're not going to want to watch your content. So I think it's just an, such an important thing to understand as you're living your life. Yeah, I try to as, as close to what it is, is is what goes on the video. And I think it's funny, sometimes I've had other people up to collaborate on videos and I'll watch their video and then I'll watch my video and I'm like, what was it? And I'll watch their video, I'm like, where was that? You know, like, what, 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 like, what was happening there? Just because there's different ways to do it. But I do, to your point, I think that when I said like why people resonate with it, I think they resonate because of the finding the person, per person being excited, but also like, the authenticity, like I'm, it's me in a tripod. And so I'm setting it up. People have a pretty good understanding when they come up, there's not like a disconnect. It's very like, what you see is what you get. And I really love it when people come up, they're like, Oh, like you're who I thought you were. I was like, 
cool. You know, that's almost like the biggest compliment you can give in like a day of social media. So let's just say when you first bought Sarah Gorda, you're at zero percent. And you, you talked about the end goal. Where is it at now? Cool. Yeah. Um the thirty five percent. And what what would take it from like thirty five percent to fifty percent? The hotel finishing, I think, would get to fifty percent. I think when we get that done, and we still have to do the plumbing, electrical. So there's still a, a lot to do, um, but the structure is there. F the hotel will get to fifty percent. Let's say cabins would get to like sixty five percent. Campsites would get to like seventy five percent. And that final twenty five percent is going to be bonus. That's going to be doing stuff like the studio, the library, all that kind of fun stuff that we do on top. You, you mentioned uh, Robert Green and Ryan Holiday, who have been you've worked with, but have also, I'm sure, been mentors of yours. You know, throughout the course of your life. Who else has been a, a really strong mentor of yours throughout this process? Ryan, first and foremost, I would say definitely. He's a great source of wisdom, Robert. Um, but a lot of local people, actually. You know, I think that when I moved up here, I almost, I feel like I inherited, or they inherited me like five or 10 grandfathers at once. You know, a lot of like older guys that have been in the desert that know their way around these parts that just understand what this experience is going to take more than I did. There's a guy very early on here named Tip. That I've actually never shown in any videos or talked about, but he's in your book, right? Yeah, he's in the book. He's he's kind of a main character in the book, which I'm excited about. He, he's he's passed away at this point, but when I first moved up here, he was a desert rat. You know, a guy's been wandering the desert for you know 50 years, and he knew how to find trails. He knew Cerro Gordo really well, and he was the first one to kind of look at me and not see me as an outsider, but look at me and say, "Hey, this is the guy that's gonna be here for a long time." And I think that vote of confidence was big. And he spent his time. He taught me how to do. He taught me how to use all the heavy machinery that I know how to use now, how to trail find, how to, you know, explore the mines. He was one of the first ones I went into the mines with. And so just a lot of local knowledge is good. Because again, I think that because everybody out here is so di isolated in the desert, there's a strong sense of self-reliance within most of the people. But there's also this understanding that the other person is going to need the self-reliance. And so I think Tip and other people were very good early on about trying to get me to where I need to, where I needed to be if I was going to kind of see this project through. What are some of the biggest lessons you learned from Tip? Oh, uh, I think he's the one that did the appreciation for history. One of, his, one of his favorite things to do, he would always tell me that we need to walk the wash. And that was his favorite phrase. And it's my favorite phrase. And walk the wash is basically, you know, the, the canyons and, and mountains is where all the snow melt and every, all the water flows. And he would say that, you know, all of the best things from all around the path of least resistance is just to walk the wash. And so we would walk the wash to find artifacts, you know, to find cool things from the past, to have a nice adventure. Like that's kind of how the town was found too, because they would have found ore down the wash and walked up until there wasn't any more ore and figured out that's kind of where the mine needed to be. Um, and so he kind of, he taught me that right before he passed away, he kind of got into a lot of discussions about leaving your mark and what people want to be remembered by and how almost like he would always kind of say in some words that the act of remembering was like a celebration in its own way. And I think it was very impactful because at this point in time, he was pretty late in um, cancer and he only had a couple of weeks to go. And so we would reminisce a lot about there's these things called petroglyphs out here. So these, there's these paintings on rocks that have been here for thousands of years. And Tip's favorite thing in the world was these petroglyphs. And he'd always tell me to go out and see them. And I think that for me, it kind of allowed me to zoom out a little bit into the micro day-to-day -day problems and kind of focus in more like, what is that story that I want to leave behind? Because you know, Tip was reminiscing on that quite a bit towards the end of his life. And so it kind of gave me a little bit of that urgency again to go back to some stoicism terms. Like it was that memento mori, which means like, remember that you're going to die. And it's not meant to be like grim or distracting. It's meant to be like motivating, kind of like clarifying to where is this little task that I'm so stressed out about really going to matter? Like, let's say in the timeline of a petroglyph, not really, you know? And so it kind of just helped clarify a lot of things for me with my time with Tip. Thanks for sharing all that. My my last question is, how do you make your money now? Is it all from like social media, like money from like TikTok and YouTube and stuff? A lot of it's that, but yeah. So I would say a lot of it's YouTube, TikTok. We have merchandise, like merch sales kind of thing. But then a lot of it's still my day job. You know, I still work with Ryan. We still have a company. We still work with Daily Stoic. And so I still have to chip in money from my day job <laughs> to the town. And so when I said before, like, I want the property to stabilize, I mean more like that it'll pay for itself a little bit. And so I think that that's one of my hopes of this year is maybe we can get this property stabilized, but primarily social media and then my day job. Brent, thank you so much for coming on, for sharing your story, for sharing what you've built. I think it's really admirable. And I think the audience is going to resonate with this conversation. I think they're going to be interested in buying your book so they can learn more about like the history and, and the whole and the entire journey behind 
your project. So if people want to buy the book, if they want to connect with you online, if they want to follow along as you're documenting stuff on social media, where's the best place to do that? Ghost Town Living is the name of the book. It's also the name of the YouTube channel where I document pretty much everything going on up here. I've put out a couple hundred videos. And yeah, the book's about finding that purpose, you know, going all in on something and just trying to live that life of adventure. And it's kind of the book I wish I had maybe four years ago before I moved up here. And so I hope people check it out. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on, man. I think the audience is really, really going to get a lot of value out of this. Thanks, Doug. Appreciate it. You got it. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, I really think you're going to like this video as well. I'll see you there.